Red Six Free. Then Jelly Roll Wharton's Tiger Ray, which is led to by the original Pixieland Jazz Band. If you were a kid growing up in Arkansas during the 70s and 80s, odds are you went to Dogpatch. The unique park nestled in the Ozark Hills was based on a comic strip by legendary cartoonist Al Cap. Dogpatch USA was full of rides, craftsmen, and other attractions like Marble Falls and a trout farm. It was also a place where the characters from his Little Abner comic strip came alive. While Dogpatch was in operation for 25 years, the gates eventually closed and the park lay dormant for decades. Even though the lofty expectations of the investors was never realized, the park could have still found moderate success. So what really happened? That's what I decided to find out. What you said is, is what I would say. Everybody, everybody says they love it, but yet they'll come and pillage and plunder and steal, and they'll pry stuff, they'll break stuff to get to get something. They'll, it, it doesn't bother them no, at all. You can't, you cannot put glass in any building. They will break all the glass. So, you know, I don't, I don't understand the mentality of people that want to destroy. It. I don't understand it. it it's constant. I mean. We were down there looking and they even stole a door off a mill. It's like, oh my God, they stole a door. Surely they must plan on coming back and stealing everything else if they take the doors. So you can't lock it up. Can't lock us out, we'll steal the doors. And that's kind of the way I feel. It's like, oh, you're coming back to steal more. And if you can't steal it, you'll tear it up. So nobody can have any good from it at all. And that's what I deal with. I can't guard it all. A lot, we have a lot.
Okay, let's let's. From 1968 on, everybody knows it was Dog Patch. Uh, prior to 1968, it was uh, owned. Most of the property was owned by the Rainey family, who operated the uh, trout farm. Well, sometime after the turn of the century, my grandfather, Albert Rainey, purchased about 800 acres uh, after the railroad had gone through and timbered out most of the uh, big trees. Uh, I think if, if memory serves me, he paid about 80 cents an acre for it. Uh, he was the uh, postmaster there at Marble Falls, and he developed uh, Mystic Caverns. He was... Uh, involved in a number of caves in northwest Arkansas and that was something that fascinated him. Uh, they also had a gift shop over at the actual falls itself where they sold souvenirs to the tourists. Uh, he later developed a trout farm there at Bluff Springs which was incorporated into Dog Patch and my uh, cousin Ernest stayed on to run the, uh, the trout farm through the Dog Patch years. Uh, it was a family business uh, Aunts and uncles and cousins were all involved in the family business from running a cave, a rock shop, the waterfall, a trout farm, stock trout stream and trout lake, and uh, gift shops. There was a blank period. Going back beyond that blank period in history, there was Wilcoxon, which was also called Marble City. Uh, for part of its life. Wilcoxon was there on Marble Falls, right on the falls itself, uh, from about 1840, 1850, somewhere around in there, to about 1920. Wilcoxon, uh, not a very attractive name. Uh, then when uh, they were building the Washington Monument, uh, one of the, if not the largest piece of marble was quarried from a site nearby, so they renamed it to Marble City. Uh, after my grandfather acquired the property and he realized that tourism could be something that you could do with this rather inhospitable landscape, uh, so he took it upon himself to have the area renamed Marble Falls because he felt it was more conducive to attracting the tourists off of Highway 7 to visit the cave or the gift shops or the waterfall and leave a little of that money behind. Grandpa, he was real uh, concerned about the land. Uh, he had a small realty business on the side and uh, he always tried to improve things that he found. He had a, a penchant for trying to locate caves and I can't imagine how many thousands of dollars and cases of dynamite, he exhausted uh, looking for those elusive sinkholes that would turn into caves, but uh, I grew up there as a young child and it was truly an idyllic uh, scene to be able to play in this pristine creek and float down the stream and walk down to the waterfall and uh, I was really lucky to experience Marble Falls be before it was incorporated into Dog Patch. When, uh, when Snow had the idea, he pitched it to Al Cap, and it all went pretty quick. It came about because uh, a man by the name of O.J. Snow from Harrison, Arkansas. He and eight other investors got together and they decided they wanted to build a dog patch. So he flew from Harrison to Cambridge, talked to my father, and convinced him 
to lease out the names, titles, and characters so they could build a dog patch. As soon as they pitched it to Al Cap and it, it fit the venue of his comic strip so well that it all happened pretty quick. It was, it was, uh, he was able to get the investment capital together because he had uh, the okay from Al Cap. So it all happened pretty quick. that it was opening at least a year or two soon. And basically was, it was, I understood, it was some of the investment, investors was wanting a return on their investment. And I'm sure that's right. There's a lot of money involved and a lot of work and, and nothing coming in and everything going out. And... Uh, so I, I suspect it was. It wasn't anything that I felt I needed to be involved in. So I just kept my mouth shut and my ears open, and that's what I understood out of it. Yes, it was rushed. It was rushed. Uh, they should have taken their time and probably opened that park a year later than what they did. But they opened it, and it was without one or two bathrooms that were working and a few other things that weren't ready yet. Oh, it looks like another typical terrifying day at dog rides, even, even worse than it is in my comics. He, would, he told CBS uh, at the dedication that uh, this was everything he envisioned that dog patch would be and it was far the best thing that, the best venture that he had ever gone into he was cautiously optimistic you know that he stayed away from it as much as he could that's why i was there they built this park, I think it was, um, I, I, I think the total acreage uh, officially was like 1,762 acres when the park was officially opened and that was, that was, that made it probably the largest theme park uh, in the world at that time, pretty sure. Certainly the largest in the United States. They, um, uh, they threw a lot of resources at it fast, so it, it it, it happened fast, and they built it for uh, to accommodate 10,000 people a day. They they felt like they could get 10,000 people a day, and opening day they had 7,000 plus, and they figured they would just build on that.
day the gates opened, I told him, I called my father and told him this is a mistake. I I said I that's my thinking. You know, I I just gave him what I thought, and I just told him I said I think it's a mistake. It's in the wrong place. There's no easy way to get here. You have to be looking for, for this place in order to get this far. I said it's not built on an interstate. It's, it's just in the wrong place. It doesn't stand a chance. I said, plus it's got to compete with Silver Dollar City, which is up and running and has been for quite a while. And it was a family-owned business at first. Well, it didn't, I mean, as good as, as successful as it was, they never achieved the numbers of 10,000 a day more than once or twice during some really special events. So they were optimistic uh, in the sense that they they figured they were they just kept figuring they were going to increase the volume of people through the park. Uh, they just uh, they lacked imagination, basically. I mean, these were businessmen. Yeah, you know, one of them was a guy who owned a hardware store. One of them was a banker. One of them was. Uh, Let's see, he owned a clothing store. You know, I mean, they they came from a business background and they tried to use that knowledge to build a theme park and you can't do that. You have, you have to have some imagination. You have to see things that aren't there yet and you have to figure out how to put them in and how to build what you want to show. And it has to be something that's specific to that park and only that park. And they didn't do that. And these guys did. They they really did not have a clear idea of what they were trying to accomplish. Therefore, they didn't really accomplish it. First year, perhaps rough, but they made a profit of about a hundred thousand dollars. Unfortunately, the profit caused trouble. Snow wanted to take the $100,000 and put it back into the park. The rest of the stockholders, some 14, said no. We want some of that money taken off of the table. Disagreement came, and Dogpatch suddenly was available if somebody was interested. And a successful Arkansas businessman from Little Rock was interested. Jess Odom saw potential in the park, and he could see big plans for its future. Odom installed former Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus as general manager. He compared running the park to running the state, like your own little war. Well, my grandfather always wanted to have his hand in something, and so uh, National Investors was starting. Um, he knew that was getting ready. He was going to sell that. He wanted to get involved in something else. He had purchased Maumel which was uh, 5,400 acres he uh, purchased towards Little Rock. And then he also uh, bought Dogpatch. Well, he hadn't bought it yet. He uh, met with, uh, there was 12 men, I believe, um, REI, that owned Dogpatch. And um, they were kind of um, unsure of each other on what they wanted to do with the profits. And so they, I believe they approached my grandfather and he was very interested in becoming a part of Dog Patch. So he bought out the biggest part of the, of the 12, I believe, that owned Dog Patch at the time. There was a couple others that stayed with my grandfather and he paid, I think, $750,000 and became um, their primary owner. But O.J. Snow and some of the other ones, I believe, were still in the project with him. But he just... He had to be doing something all the time, and he had a dream about that too, of what he wanted the park to be like. He wanted to be uh, competitive with Silver Dollar City and some of the other places around here, and so uh, he started off his dream like that.
drinking whiskey like it's wine, spending money like it's time, living days like nights. What a hard, hard life, drinking whiskey like it's wine, spending money like it's time, living days like nights. What a hard, hard life, what a hard, hard life. What a hard, hard life, what a hard, hard life. Well, my grandfather had a acquired dog patch and it was running and doing well in 72 and so he wanted to make this a year-around park. He wanted winter and uh, summer so you could come year-round. So he uh, built the ski lodge and he acquired uh, snow blowers to make snow uh, so that you could ski in Arkansas. <laughs> Well, I just have to laugh a little bit. Um, you know, I, I come from southern Indiana, and, you know, we knew that you could make snow there. You just can't store it outside during the day. And that was the folly here. They had a huge snow-making operation going on. Problem was, the next day the sun would shine and it would melt the snow. And at nighttime it would freeze, so you'd have blue ice and they'd blow some more snow on top of that. So it was one of the fastest ski slopes in the world. I thought this was crazy. <laughs> I'd be honest with you. <laughs> well, our winters are not cold enough to support it. And then I saw him working on a hillside that was death-defyingly steep. And they shoved large rocks down to the bottom. And I thought, my God, there's no way to stop before you hit these rocks. And, and But it was interesting. And again, it was beyond my deal. Nobody asked me about it. And I didn't have a dollar in it. And I, and I thought, well, it's... If something like that works, that would uh, uh, work for the winter months when things are uh, would be a little slow. <laughs> I thought that was the silliest idea I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> I, I read that in the paper, actually. I remember some of us sitting around, and I read that they were putting one in, and I thought, oh, my gosh. There's no way, because you've got hills, but how are you going to keep the snow there? I mean, let's face it, this is not a get cold and stay cold environment. And I just, I couldn't imagine. I always wanted to go up and see it and never made it. I guess it's just as well. 
But no, I never thought that was a good idea. That, that was just horrific years. I mean, we, we had some good years right after uh, when it turned cold again. You know, we made some beautiful snow. We had snow piled up eight feet deep of just powder. Well, they said that the lights went dim and the water pressure dropped. They would, they would cuss if they were taking a shower. That they would just not be able to finish the shower when they turned on the snow machines. I hope it worked. We would go up there and rent some chalets on New Year's Eve, yeah. and they would have a band come in and a dance, and we could just stay there and walk from the dance back to the chalet, and we'd be watching them blow snow. And, <laughs> and it was all very interesting, but you could not have got me drunk enough or paid me enough to get on a pair of skis to go down that hill. <laughs> the, the top floor where we are now was completely open and, and of course it was built, you know, commercially so it's uh, steel reinforced concrete floors even up here on the second floor. So they had the band up here and a dance floor and of course the commercial kitchen and restaurant downstairs so even though they quit skiing they, they kept it open as a resort for a while and it was quite a place to come and dance and party and have good food. It, it did okay a couple of winters. Uh, his utility bills, I can remember mom and dad talking about, they ran around $22,000 a month, which even back then, even now, <laughs> that's a big utility bill. So uh, Marble Falls quickly started draining Dog Patch. Dog Patch was having to hold up uh, the debt that Marble Falls was creating. I was part of the management team and, and uh, after, you know, um, the initial years, and I remember him coming in and saying, you know, we built it to be a, a bit of a tax write-off, but I we didn't build it to be, to lose $2 million, or I don't remember the number that he said, but he said we didn't, we didn't do it to be a total loss of what it's been, guys. We got to do something. And there really you just wasn't anything you could do. We did everything in our power. Bill and I stayed out there many a night and tried to blow ice into snow, and it just don't work. You know, when it's 30 degrees, you can't make snow. Not artificial. It's a, the best for natural snow, I think, they say, but it's not when you're trying to blow it out of a cannon. By the 1970s, Al Cap had become controversial as he took aim at the nation's counterculture. Cap retired in 1977 and died a few years later. His obituary in Time magazine listed a variety of things about the artist, but didn't even mention the park. But the obituaries for hillbilly programming had been written for years. Americans' tastes had changed. Shows that had been the cornerstones of major networks had been canceled in favor of more urban-themed programming and even positive ratings couldn't help them. One actor was quoted as saying, CBS canceled everything with a tree, even Lassie. With Little Abner fading from the public's mind, the failed ski resort, and personal injury lawsuits looming, the handwriting was on the wall for owner Jess Odom. Union Platters Bank had begun foreclosure in 1976 to collect over $3 million in loans and a bond issue to restructure the massive debt had failed. 
Odom was looking to sell the park, and he had a few offers on the table. An organization called God's Patch wanted to rebrand Dog Patch as a Christian theme park, and another group of California investors were interested in moving the whole park to Ozark. However, none of those plans materialized. In 1980, Ozark Family Entertainment took control of the park, offering to take over the park's massive debt from Odom. Securing a $5 million tourism bond from Newton County, the park was now led by dog patch veterans who wanted to update the park and pivot from the Little Abner theme. I'm Gordon Hansen, broadcast producer for Dog Patch, and I'm pleased to announce that the big news in this year's marketing strategy is Denver Pile, star of CBS TV's Dukes of Hazard program. While special events like this one gave the park record attendance on occasion, regular attendance continued to struggle. Dog Patch brought in superheroes, ninja turtles, and country stars to keep their momentum. However, those marketing strategies were costly and failed to address the underlying problem. Although lower in numbers, families continued to come to the park and make memories throughout the 80s. By the late 1980s, the park had changed ownership once more, and Dogpatch couldn't seem to get any traction. Several attempts to change the business model failed, including doing away with admission altogether. Even dropping the Little Abner theme didn't seem to help. And while times were increasingly tough at Dogpatch, things were quite different one hour's drive north. It was reported by 60 Minutes in 1992 that Branson was getting over 4 million visitors per year. Why Branson? Many believe it leads back to the Beverly Hillbillies. In 1969, the show filmed five episodes on location in Silver Dollar City. The Clampets stayed at the Silver Dollar City Hotel, and the story took them on adventures throughout a fictional town. As the show continued to run in syndication, fans of the Beverly Hillbillies continued to be drawn to the park. That's when a group of musicians, the Presley family, decided to build a small theater down the road from the park. With their success, more and more theaters followed. Soon, the main drag in Branson was full of hotels, restaurants, and retail stores. By the early 90s, Branson was getting over a billion dollars a year in tourism revenue. But very little of that money was making its way to Dogpatch. By 1993, the staff had been drastically cut, and the park was a shadow of its former self. Attendance continued to plummet, and operating costs quickly outpaced profits. Once again, debt was weighing down the organization. On October 14, 1993, Dogpatch USA closed for the season, never to open for another. What killed Dogpatch USA? Was it the location? Was it Little Abner fading from the public's memory? Was it the ski lodge draining resources from the park? Was it the billion dollar juggernaut one hour to the north? It was all those things. From the start, the park had an uphill battle, but once Little Abner disappeared from the pages of American newspapers, it was only a matter of time. You know, if they'd have done smart things with the money in the beginning and done smart things throughout, the park would have never closed. But people need to understand there's 
huge difference between a theme park and a thrill park. You know, and a lot of people don't understand there's water parks, thrill parks, theme parks, you know. And when Al Cap died and Little Abner went out of syndication, the theme, Little Abner and Dog Patch, was dead. It survived after Al Cap's death, but not long because the theme was gone. It was out of syndication. People no longer associated with it. So they had to regroup and think about what they wanted to become. And they decided that they would focus on the thrill park aspect, rides and thrills. Well, everybody knows that thrills are short-lived. You know, you ride a roller coaster three or four times and you want to ride another one. And that's what happened with the thrill aspect of it. You know, Little Abner was dead and now, you know, everybody comes and rides a wild mouse three or four times and they're going to go to Silver Dollar City or they're going to go up to Six Flags uh, out of St. Louis. I mean, you know, if you really want to thrill. So they didn't, they didn't reinvent themselves correctly. In the end, the park was foreclosed and sold in Jasper on the courthouse steps on December 20th, 1994. CL and Ford Carr purchased the park, but the new owners did very little with the property and left it, for the most part, abandoned. This left the people in the area very unsure about the property's future. In 2002, Carr posted the park on eBay with a minimum bid of $1 million, but he received no bids. As one might expect, someone eventually was injured on the property, and Dogpatch was seized after the Arkansas Supreme Court ruled against Carr in a personal injury lawsuit. Once again, the property was on the market and remained a headache for local law enforcement. The result of all the years of neglect are astonishing. Everything that could be stolen has been stolen, and anything that could be broken has been destroyed. For high school kids in the 90s, Dog Patch was a place for underage drinking and anarchy, and the property had the scars to prove it. While no one wanted to speak on camera about the subject, they all agreed that the park had become radioactive to lenders and investors. Dog Patch was a place where money went to die. And this would be the end of the story, but it's not. Bud Pelser took ownership of the park with a partner in 2014. While many have owned the park since the final season, Bud has been the most active of them all. He's been clearing years of overgrowth and even holding events at the park. So once again, Dogpatch is alive with activity from time to time. He has even opened the park for people to explore. After signing a liability waiver, of course. Bud has other business interests in Harrison, and he seems to have made a home here in the Ozarks. What the future holds for the village of Dogpatch is unknown, but it appears Bud will be part of that future. Liability insurance is phenomenal, and the cost of rides is uh, prohibitive. Uh, Thrill Park is not a good investment. But I was kind of in that uh, special group that uh, 
uh, you know, skill because I could train a chicken to, you know, pick the high card and a pig to sit down and answer yes or no questions, you know. And uh, a dog, I would ask this dog the what kind of started it all if she'd be a, rather be a Democrat or a dead dog. And she'd fall over like you shot her with a cannon, you know. I believe I saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming out of their shells tour in which they came on stage and they didn't have shells and they all played instruments and sang songs and I thought it was kind of weird. I think Michelangelo had a uh, like a little drum machine that he just kind of carried around because they all wanted to dance. But uh... Oh, it was hot as blue blazes. We had what, the, what everybody called the dog patch tan. You were tan from the neck up and you were tan from the wrist down and there was a strip of tan from the ankle to just below the knee because that's the way the uh, costumes fit on the guys. And then of course they had the girls costumes and if you've ever seen Al Cap's depiction of the um, females in Ladner, their costumes were a bit different from ours, <laughs> thankfully. And so... <laughs> Next thing I know, uh, reeling in this fish, you know, I'll bring it in guy comes up he's like hey let me have that and he tagged it and took it to the restaurant we all had fresh trout fantastic trip and that was the first fish you ever caught the very first fish i ever caught i've been hooked ever since it was very short-sighted i think i i you know i don't want to beat up anybody in the past i i think uh, i think a lot of them did the best they could i, I think that they just they just maybe listened to the wrong advice or saw things develop in other cities that would work here and it just didn't. But they really should have uh, been paying attention to what was working elsewhere in a good way, especially in the Ozarks. Red Six Free.